having some problems in the choir. Let's, let's pray for her. She's having some health issues right now. Let's lift our name, lift Jesus' name. Let's pray for her right now. In the name of Jesus, God, we come to you. tonight. Amen. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. I'm going to give Sister Twyla Bryan a chance to get this music out. How many appreciate our musicians? Let's give them a hand, amen? And our sound engineer and videographers and all of that make this uh, what it is here at Dallas. And it's just a volunteer effort for people and I appreciate all the time and effort that everyone puts in behind the scenes and the choir and everyone. We just are blessed here at Dallas. I wanted to uh, uh, give a word of testimony. I didn't know this, but Last week in our class, or the week before, Brother Hester, he sits right here. He's got on a uh, raspberry-colored shirt here with a beige tie. And he gave in a testimony. And uh, a lot of times, you know, when you look across the congregation, everybody looks fine and nobody looks like they're going through anything. You don't never know what somebody is suffering with. And uh, I know, Sister Jenny, I'm going to give this word of testimony to build your faith. God, is, God knows where you are, and he can touch you, and he will heal you and help you. But Brother Hester in 2003 had cancer, and the doctors had given up on him and told him that he was not going to live. According to the testimony he gave us in class, and he was down below 80 pounds, and he was suffering. And he had read in the Bible the story, and I believe it's Hezekiah 
put his head up against the wall and he said, I know it wasn't the wall that healed me, but I had to get an answer from God. And he crawled over to a wall in his house and put his head up against the wall and he began to pray, Jesus, touch me. And he said, ever since that day, he started getting better. And he went back to the doctor and they said, we can't understand what's going on here, but we can't find anything wrong with you. And that's 13 years ago. And we want to give God praise for that. Amen. So whatever you're going through tonight, don't think that God will not answer your prayer. I know many of you have been in a long valley. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you have had illness. And some of you have just gone through trials with your, with you and your own family. You've got lost loved ones that are out, children. Um, but I tell you this. If you don't, I remember Brother Holcomb said something a long time ago. If He said, if you've not had problems in your house, he said, get ready, because one of these days it's going to come to your door. Isn't it wonderful to know that we can call upon Jesus? And there's one thing that I know about is when we come to this house, we ought to be worshiping him. He has blessed me so much beyond what I deserve. A guy asked me the other day, he said, how you doing? I said, better than I deserve. And he kind of looked at me strangely and said, you know what? I am too. So we all are doing better than what we deserve. We deserve death, but Jesus took our place. So let's all worship tonight. Amen. Father, I see that you are drawing a line in the sand, and I want to be standing on the side, holding your hand. So let your kingdom come. Let it live in me. This is my prayer. This is my plea. Let the worst burn the 
I've lost some good friends along life's way Some loved ones departed in heaven to stay But thank God I didn't lose everything I've lost faith in people who said they care In the time of my crisis
blessings I've let them slip away I've lost my focus and I went astray but thank God I didn't lose everything now I've lost possessions that were so dear and oh I know I've lost some battles because I was walking I've let them just slip away Cause I lost my focus And I went astray But thank God He didn't let me lose everything Now I've lost possessions That were so dear And I know I've lost some battles By walking in fear But in the midst of
wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus. I'm so glad to say that from sin He's freed us. It can't be bought by wealth or fame. It only comes through Jesus' name. There's victory in each trying hour by faith in His mighty power.
Everybody say praise the Lord one time. Amen, amen. I want the ushers to come. We're going to receive our tithe and our offerings. Hey, remember, remember, next Sunday night we'll be having a water baptismal service. So let's remember that. Amen. How many believe in water baptism? Everybody ought to raise your hand. <laughs> if you don't believe in it, you're the one that needs to be baptized. <laughs> I'm picking on you. Amen. Father, bless this offering. Multiply it tonight. Bless the remainder of this service. Let the Holy Ghost be here. Woo! In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're glad to see all the visitors with us. I see a sister over to my right here, back in the middle back there. She's a new face right here. We're glad to have you. Give her a hand. Amen. I don't know if you've been here before. If you haven't, then you're welcome. If you have or not. And all of you, that's Pinley. Is that right? I said Pinley. My wife remembers her years ago. She used to come to our revivals. He told me she's 90-some years old now. 80, well, that's close. <laughs> Amen. We've got my mother-in-law. I believe she's 94. Is that right? 94. She'll have 94 more. You know better than that, don't you? Well, we appreciate you. Amen. I have a group coming to sing now. Quartet, I believe it is. Worship God as they come to sing.
is on your way to glory land there's a land that's fairer than day and by faith I can see it afar brother Watts good to have you with us God bless you give him a hand amen amen I like that old time singing quartets southern gospel the favorite amen appreciate you being here this could be the last service. Jesus may come. But if he does, I'm ready to go. Are you ready? It means more than the silver and gold of this world than anything is to be ready to meet the Lord. Everybody stand, if you will, please. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts. 
chapter 9 and verse 31. We're glad to have all the visitors. Give them a good hand wherever you're from. <laughs> Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer and the opportunity one more time to preach your word. We pray you'll bless this congregation, bless the altar service, increase our faith, move on everyone watching the internet. Those that are lost, let the hand of God be upon them. Oh, now Messiah, touch us, Lord. My God, Woo. we need it. I need it, God. Mother Sunday. Thank you again. Let the freedom be here during the mission, the message of the word in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. In the book of Acts, chapter 9 and verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Let me read that scripture just once more. Acts chapter 9 verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. I want to speak tonight for a few moments on the subject fear and comfort fear and comfort you can be seated if you will this scripture here is right in the middle of a time of persecution when the apostle Paul had been a mean person he was a very educated man very proud man knew everything about the Jews and loved the Jewish religion but he had an encounter one day that was going to change course in his life. Going to change what he was. He was a persecutor of the church. But now he's going to be a believer. He's going to preach the gospel. He's going to turn the world upside down. He's going to cause havoc in the world and not in the church. Because God has changed him. He saw Jesus. And I want to tell you when you see Jesus there's going to be a change. You cannot know him without changing. I'm talking about if you're a sinner. If you are a persecutor of God and his cause and you do not know the Lord Jesus, when you have an encounter with him, he's going to change your way of life. And I'm so glad he changed me. Praise God, I'm changed. I'm just exactly what I want to be because I'm what God wanted me to be. He saved my soul. He sanctified me. He baptized me in the good Holy Ghost. He called me to preach and made me a fit subject for the kingdom of God. And my name is written down in heaven. And if the rapture takes place, I'm going to leave here along with everybody else, and that includes you, that have had this change. But the apostle Paul had put the church on notice. He was taking men and women bound and having some of them even killed. But when he met Jesus, he became an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. He went into the city. He got converted. He became a disciple of the Lord Jesus. The Lord told him to, that he was going to cause him to go to the children of Israel and to the kings and to the Gentiles and preached the word and he said I'll show you how great things you must suffer for my name's sake Ananias went to him cause God got a hold of Ananias Jesus did and told him to go visit Apostle Paul Saul of Tarsus at the time Saul had had this encounter and he needed to know something about Jesus well Ananias was afraid said I've heard about this man he's wicked he's evil he persecutes your church but he said oh but Ananias He's not going to be the same. He's praying. My God, if you want to be different, you need to learn to pray. You need to learn to get a hold of the Lord. And I'm telling you, you can be different if you'll pray. So you're going to see things different. When you call on the Lord, you can't convert a person until they get converted. You can harp on them. You can judge them. You can say bad things about them. You can warn them. 
You can say anything you want to say, but until they start praying, you will not do them much good. You can sow seed, and that seed will get a hold of them and bring them to an altar of repentance, but they have to pray. So Paul is praying, and Ananias goes and said, The Lord that appeared unto thee in the way as I camest, as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He had become blind for three days. He couldn't see. After he had that vision of Jesus Christ, he was going to take away the natural sight of Apostle Paul, which is figuratively there, of the natural things. And when he sees again, he's going to see spiritual things. The Lord healed him and it's like great scales had fell from his eyes. And he was received sight. And the Bible said he arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat and strengthened, he was certain days with the disciples and he went straightway into the synagogues and preached that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was talking about something he had experienced. And so he had been converted, but many people didn't know he had been converted. And there were those as he began to witness for Christ and as he went and ministered the word of the Lord, they turned on him and some of the Jews wanted to kill him. And the disciples led him down through a basket over the wall where he could escape. He made his way to Jerusalem. He wanted to meet the apostles and the church family, but they were afraid of him. And Barnabas took him and said, he's all right now, he's met Jesus. I want to tell you, when you meet Jesus, old things are passed away and all things become new. But this scripture is very powerful that I've read to you in Acts chapter 9 and verse 31 because the apostle Paul had just been converted. There are two essential things to Christianity that the church must possess. They are fear and comfort. And that's what this particular scripture is here about, here in this text that I've read to you. The church was in fear. There was persecution spread the land. But God has got a hold of the main one that's causing some of the persecution, and he's changed him. And there's rest. The persecution is not like it was. And the church has come to a rest But the Bible said here that in Judea and Galilee and Samaria, the church was edified walking in the fear and in the comfort of the Lord. Fear will cause a church to walk carefully. I'm not talking about a kind of fear that scares you. I'm talking about a fear of reverence. What's wrong with a lot of people today? They don't reverence God. They don't reverence his word. This generation has lost the fear of God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. But fear came on the church and it caused them to walk, as I said, carefully. And comfort was given to the church to support them in times of trial and in times of of, uh, distress. Fear has to do with man's work. And his dealings with God, our reverence to God. It's our relation to God. God has given me a relationship with him. And I'm related to him by the new birth, but I have a relationship with him. I can talk to him, and he can talk to me. He can show me things. He can give me a revelation. He can cause me to walk upright before him. Comfort has to do with God's work and his dealings with man. Reverence gets us in touch with God. Comfort gets God in touch with us. It's not enough for me to touch God. I've got to have God touch me. There's times I need the touch of God. The enemy's coming hard. The world is putting pressure on those that serve God. And it's coming swiftly to our nation. But we are reverencing God. We have the right attitude, the right mentality, the right place in God that we ought to be. Therefore, God is going to remember us. God is going to comfort us. He's not going to let you go through something that you can't bear. He'll be there with you to help you in the distress and in the things that you face. 
I want us to look at the fear of the Lord and then I want us to look at the comfort of the Lord. Fear comprehends. Reverence comprehends. It comprehends the presence of God. When God comes and the Lord begins to move and he walks into our midst, there ought to be a reverence concerning God and his cause. When we're in the house of God, this is not a playground. This is not a place just to have games and fun. We're in the presence of God. We're lifting up holy hands. We're praising God. We're honoring him. It is a place of reverence. And because of his presence, it will cause reverence. Jacob was on his way to Padanaram. Esau's going to kill him. But he's going to reverence God because he's needing God. He's running for his life because he took the birthright. That is Jacob. He took the birthright. And Esau was the firstborn. He was supposed to have it. It made Esau mad. He's going to kill him. So Rebekah, his mother, sends him into the land of Padanaram to go to Bethuel, her father's house, and take a, a wife of one of the daughters of Laban. He's on his way. He doesn't know what to expect. He knows Esau's mad. He probably lingers and he lays down at a time and it's getting twilight and night is about to fall. And he's looking in the bushes. He's looking here. He's looking there because he expects maybe any time Esau's going to jump out on him. And he doesn't know what to do. He's going to a land he's never been to before. He's going to a place where he wants to find a wife and he's going there at the bidding of his father and his mother. The blessings has already been pronounced upon him by Isaac. He lays his hands on him and tells him to go and said, you have the blessing of Abraham and you be blessed like him and you multiply and you become a part of that seed. You just go and you expect the blessings as you go. I want to tell you, if you serve God, you can go step by step and you can have the blessings of God. I'm serving God. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. But I'm serving God because it is good to serve the Lord. It is a blessing to know Jesus. It is an honor to have him with us and guiding us and helping us. Jacob is going to realize the reverence of God in the midst of a most troublesome time when he doesn't know what to do and he lays his head on the rocks for the pillow and as he begins to lay there and night is falling in, he has a dream and he dreams about a ladder sitting on the earth and the top reaching into heaven and the angels of God are ascending and descending on that ladder. Now he needed this. There's times you're gonna need something special. Just the mediocre things of this world are not gonna satisfy. You'll have a trial where you'll have to have a special touch. You'll have to seek God because the enemy's coming hard. But oh, let me tell you, as hard as the enemy comes, God comes harder. As big as the devil is, our God is bigger. He's bigger than anything you're gonna have to face. He will help you along the way so he sees these angels ascending and descending he hears a voice saying I am the God of your father Abraham and Isaac he said the land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it unto thy seed and you're going to be like the dust of the earth you're going to spread to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and said I'm going to go with you and I'll be with you until I bring you back into this land. And I will not leave you until I have done that that I have spoken unto you of. It put a reverence in Jacob. He said, how dreadful is this place? The Bible said he was afraid. He said, this is none other but the house of God and the gate of heaven. He was afraid, he was, knew that God 
had been there and he took those stones and raised them up and made a pillar and he anointed them with oil and he called the name of the place Bethel, house of God. He said, if God will go with me, my God, he didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for the things of the world. He said, if he'll give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, until I come to my father's house in peace, he's going to be my God. <laughs> he wasn't planning on staying in Padanaram. That was not his inheritance. He was only going there for the time being, running from Esau, but he stayed there a lot longer than he realized he's going to stay. He stayed for 20 years. But God doesn't look at time. He made time. He may give you a promise and it may not work out for years. It may not come to pass for a long time. But if God said it, you can put a stamp on it and realize it will get to its destination. When you put a stamp on the mail, you go to the mailbox, you don't worry. I mailed a payment the other day, something for the church and it was raining. And I had my envelope and put a stamp on it and went to the post office and stuck my arm out as quick as I could because it wasn't raining here, but a mile down the road, quickly, the rain began to fall. And I, I got it in the mailbox. I'm sure it didn't get wet, but there's a stamp on that mail. And that stamp has an a, a envelope with an address on it. And that address is where that, that place, that mail's going. And that stamp says it's going to get there. I'm telling you, God has stamped us with the Holy Ghost. He stamped us with the presence of God. He's given us a high calling. He's anointed us to do the will of God. And you can be sure God has stamped you. He told you there's a heaven. He told you there's a hell. But God said if you'll serve Jesus Christ and you'll live a holy life, you'll be able to get to heaven. You're going to land in the city. He has the address on it. And the stamp it's going to get me there. You don't put a stamp on it and it's not going to go. It'll come back to the return address. But I want to tell you, God doesn't send any mail back. Not if it's stamped. If you'll use it. Jacob said, how dreadful is this place? This place is going to be the house of God and the gate of heaven and the tenth of what I gain. I'll give unto God. But I like what he said. If God will go with me, that's the key to it all. I talked about it this morning. I need God's presence and a reverence for God will cause his presence to be with me. And when I realize his presence, I must honor that presence. I must humble myself to that presence. But he said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, the gate of heaven. That word dreadful in the Hebrew means to revere. It's to be had in reverence. That's what we need for God in the church. We need it in the country. We need it in the world. People have lost their respect for God. There's many people that say there is no God. But the Bible tells us, I believe in Psalm 14 and 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are correct. They've done abominable works. I want to tell you, if there is a God, it makes no difference what the devil says or what anybody else says. You may have to see a ladder. You may have to see the angels, but you can be assured of one thing. God is going to help you if you will reverence and fear his holy name. We need to reverence his name. That reverence of, of the name, power, authority. There is no power but of God. The powers that be, they're ordained of God. God sent the power to the church. He gave us a Holy Ghost. We have the authority. It doesn't matter whether people like it or not. It doesn't matter whether they receive it or not. It does not change God. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 58 declares, If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book that thou may fear this glorious and fearful name though the, through the Lord thy God then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful he goes on to say if you don't fear me if you don't reverence me 
If you don't honor me, you're going to get plagues. How many times in that wilderness did God have to be severe with the folks because they didn't honor him? They grumbled and they complained and they didn't reverence God. There was fear on the church. There was reverence. There was rest because God had changed some things. God had done a work. And I'm telling you, the church doesn't need more programs. We don't need more talent. We need the power of God. We need the Holy Ghost. We need a reverence for God's presence and we need to know that every time we come to the house of God, the Lord is going to meet with us and he's going to help us and touch us and we're going to leave different than we came. We're going to leave edified. There's a dread of displeasing God if you really know him. You don't want to cause him to be upset at you you want to reverence him and his presence and what he is King Saul had got 3,000 of his men together to go to seek David David had been anointed king and Saul didn't like it but he brought it on himself because he did not obey God he didn't keep the laws of God he did his own thing a handsome man taller than anybody else from the shoulder up but he was put in office, but he wasn't put in office. But God, it wasn't God's will for him to be king. He told them what kind of king they're going to have, and they cried for a king anyway. He said they're going to, he's going to cause you trouble. He's going to take your sons and put them in his army. He's going to take your daughters and make them cooks and so forth and servants. And you're going to have to serve this king. But they cried, we want to be like everybody else. I want to tell you, when you want to get like everybody else, you're headed down the wrong road because we're not like everybody else we belong to Jesus we're anointed of God we have a mark upon us we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise we belong to Jesus tonight King Saul seeking David's life he keeps us seeking for him and he goes upon the rocks and the mountains the, to search for him he goes where the sheep are kept and there were places in the mountains caves where there would be sheep and David was a shepherd and they had these places and David's hiding from Saul but God had already told David you're going to win you're going to be king Saul couldn't stop it I don't care what the devil does I don't care what politicians do I don't care what happens in this world they cannot stop God God has a mandate God has a plan and God's plan will be fulfilled I want to be right in the middle of it my God I don't want to oppose God I want to be in the middle of God I want to be in his plan he has a plan for the church he had a plan for David and Saul couldn't stop it he was a mighty king, Saul was, but God brought him down. And David had told, or God had told David that there would be a time when Saul would be submitted into his hands. David reverenced the name of that king. He reverenced that anointing. He reverenced Saul. He reverenced God. He knew that God had given him a promise, but he didn't want to take it into his own hands. And sometimes it's hard to wait for God to move, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll man up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. He is the Lord. David said, I'm not going to touch King Saul. Those men didn't agree with David. He had some mighty warriors Mighty men of David followed him everywhere he went. And Saul is out looking for David. 3,000 of his men. He knew to get a hold of David to get him, he'd have to have a big army, a, a, a lot of soldiers. So he's ready to, to bring David into custody and probably would have killed him if he could have. But he's going in a cave, Saul is, and he's wanting to rest and he covers up himself and he goes in there to rest and David and his men are in there. They're in the cave and they see Saul. And of course, they tell David, this is your chance. This is the opportunity that God has given you to kill him. God said he'd bring him to this place and he'd give you the opportunity to do anything to Saul that you want to do to him. 
and he cut uh, the skirt of uh, uh, Saul, half of his skirt off down and pulled it off of his garment and, and his heart smote him. He couldn't kill him. He said, oh no. He looked at his men and his men were just waiting for him to put the sword through his heart and to kill him. But David said, oh no, God forbid that I put my hand on him. He's the anointed of the Lord. I'll not be the one to touch him. And he didn't kill him, but he had the skirt in his hand, the material that he had cut off from Saul's garment. And he runs out the door. And of course, Saul, the cave Saul comes out and he's leaving and David cries and says oh king the king looks back at David is this David David says to him said look here I've got the material in my hand said I've had the authority to kill you and you listen to the wrong crowd Saul King Saul you're listening to the people and you're trying to do me hurt because you are saying that I'm going to hurt you. I'm not out to hurt you. I'm just a figure that God has chosen in order to do the work of God. I'm not trying to hurt you and you're running around here and you're hunting me down and you're listening to somebody that's telling you that I'm out to hurt you. You see this garment here? I was just in the cave with you. I could have killed you but God wouldn't let me because you're the anointed of God. Who do you think you've come out against? You've not come out against a dog or against a flea. I'm David. David was a mighty warrior. But he said, I will not touch you. King Saul begins to fear. He says, you're better than I am. You're more righteous than I am. Said, you showed me good. And I haven't done anything but show you evil. And said, you could have killed me. And said, I want you to remember me when you come into your kingdom. Said, I know that God is going to give you the kingdom. I don't want you to cut off my seed. I want you to remember me. But you would have thought it would have been over. After that had happened, that King Saul would have given up. And he would not have pursued David anymore. But just a few chapters later, he's right on the, the war path again. He's going after David. He's wanting to kill David. But Saul got in such a mess until God wouldn't hear him anymore. He prayed and sought God. He resorted to a witch. He supposed to have called Samuel up and talked to him. I don't believe it was really Samuel, but he went to a search after a familiar spirit and the spirit of the Lord left him. He became so entangled in his himself until he fell on his own sword and he committed suicide. He left in that kind of condition because he did not reverence the name of God. He did not reverence the authority of God but David was the opposite. He was counting the stars out there one day. He was in the fields and the shepherd was taking care of the sheep and the lion and the bear is coming. He's protecting those sheep. The sheep he's honored of God he reverences God when he comes to his position he's qualified because he's already been with God King Saul was disqualified because he had no relationship with God this Christian walk is not do's and don'ts hear me clearly now it's not do's and don'ts it's an experience it's what you are. It's not what you do or don't do. If you have the experience and you live right and you honor God and you open up your vessel and give him it all, all the things that you have, everything, spirit, soul, mind, and body, you give it to him, you're going to have the fullness of God. You can walk any way you want to walk. God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything, but I choose to serve the Lord. I'm not ashamed of his holy power. I'm not ashamed of holiness. I'm not ashamed of separation. I believe the Bible teaches that. Israel was not to mingle with the Canaanite nations. When they went into Canaan, they were to run them out, and they didn't do it, and God put them to tribute 
And they had to stay there and it become a thorn to them because uh, they didn't run them out and they had to pay taxes and so forth. God said, separate yourself. Don't fool with them. Don't mess with them. Get away from them. Be totally committed unto me. King Saul didn't have that. The fear of the Lord and wisdom run hand in hand. Psalm 111 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding. Have all they that do his commandments, his praise endureth forever. A good understanding, the commandments of God, living for God, doing his will, walking a straight and narrow, coming out and being holy and separated. Not man's ideology, but God's command, God's mandate for his people is to be a separated people, separated unto his cause, living worthy of him, not because a preacher preaches things, not because of things that people say, but because it's God's will. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Paul told that to the church at Thessalonica. The church has got away from a lot of these things. They become offensive because they're not committed. Anything God tells you to do is not to be an offense. It's to be a blessing. Oh my God. He caught a motion and I. If you have to made to do anything, it won't do you any good. You surrender to him. And you say, God, show me the way. I want to walk in it. I want to be worthy of you. I, you just can't legislate it. It comes from God. It's something that happens to you. It's a reverence. It's a fear for God. The church had fear. The fear of the Lord will drive out the fear of Satan. You don't have to be afraid of the Lord or the devil if you fear the Lord. Yes. 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 Trust me. Don't lean to yourself. Don't look to your own abilities. You're a failure. You're a mishap. But because of my spirit, I have made you somebody. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill. You cannot be hid. Your light is going to shine. You're going to have influence. People are going to see you. And they need to see me when they see you. Not the flesh projected, but the power of my Holy Spirit. The power of my love must be reflected in your life as a child of God. As you go day by day, saith the Lord. Raise up your hands and praise. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Where do you get it from, preacher? I get it from the book. I'm not preaching my theology. I'm not preaching my convictions. I'm telling you what the Bible says. We better get in touch with God because these people that are playing church and when the screws are tightened down and the vice is getting deeper and more of a grip on, on the world and the devil's coming out of the cracks and he's running against everything that's right, you're going to have to be where you ought to be with God. You're going to have to be prayed up. You're going to have to love God more than flesh. You must be willing to give your life. You must not love your life unto death. You must serve Jesus Christ reverence that name fear causes you to reverence apostle Peter became a giant for God because he feared God instead of men he was arrested taken to prison because he preached the gospel the Sadducees and the chief priests got mad at him and they threw him into jail but the angel of the Lord by night came to them and told them to go and speak in the temple the things of God. They went early in the morning. They couldn't wait to get back out there and preach. And they were preaching. Well, they was going to try them. They had them in jail. They'd arrested them. And they were going to try them. And when they went to get them at the prison, the man that went to get them and bring them to trial, 
He said, I went to the prison. It was shut with all safety, and the keepers were before the door. But when I looked inside, there was no man there. Well, what happened? God sent an angel. I want to tell you, you may get in jail for a night, but joy's coming in the morning. He said, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. God is going to shake that cage. God is going to burst open those doors. God is going to give you freedom. You're going to stand in glory. You're going to walk in love. You're going to live in light because you know God. Simon Peter was released. And there comes somebody to the meeting where they were supposed to try them and said, they're down there preaching again. Well, they should have expected that. You can't shut up a man of God. There have been thousands of people down through time that have died martyred death. For this gospel. They stoned Stephen to death for it. And many have had their heads cut off. And they've been put on a cross. And they've been pulled asunder. If you read the Fox's book of martyrs. You'll read how that they suffered such agony and pain. Just because they were Christians. But they went and got a hold of those disciples. And brought them before the council. And and when they had brought them in. They set them there. And they said did we not straightly command you. That ye not teach in this name. And behold ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And intend to bring this man's blood upon us. I would to God. That the church one more time. Would fill this earth. With the doctrine of the Lord. With the love of Jesus. Jesus preaching that he died on a cross and he arose from the dead and he ascended to heaven and he's at the right hand of the father and he's coming back again I want to tell you don't you drop your head don't you feel like you're intimidated by the the encroachment of this world lift up your eyes your redemption draws nigh the Lord is soon to appear for his church You need to count the days and you need to take inventory by the hour and by the minute and even by the second. You need to search your heart and know where you stand. Don't be afraid of what people think or say. Pull yourself into my presence and let me scrutinize your life. Get on the table of operation. And let me open you up. And I will put in what you need. And I will pull out what you must not have. But I do love you. And I will have a church. And I will come with healing in my wings. And I will keep my promise. For I am the Lord. And I change not. And therefore you will not be consumed. Saith the Lord. When they set them before the trial. Peter said we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hang on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and, and, and repentance of sin. And he said and we are his witness of these things and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. The Bible said they got so mad that when they heard him they were cut to the heart and they took counsel to kill him. This world hates Jesus. They hate the church. And I'm going to tell you if the church don't, uh, don't get some kind of hatred it's not the church. It's just a big organism of foolishness that's having service and doing some crazy things. I'm telling you the real church is not liked in this world. Never has been. We're a misfit. Our heavenly Father, our citizenship is in heaven from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change our vile body that it may be likened unto his glorious body according to the work and whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. He's going to bring it to himself. Don't you want to be a part? I don't have any problems with living the life. I love it. I want Jesus. I'm not listening to some Johnny come lately preacher try to explain every promise out of this book. 
I'm not going to listen to some compromising preacher that tells me you don't have to live a holy life. You can do what you want to. You've got churches that's got homosexuals in the church. People living together in the church or not living together, not even married and they're teaching Sunday school. You got them smoking cigarettes and they're on the church council. I'm talking about the church of God. What happened somewhere down the road that pastor didn't preach. He didn't tell people how to live. He didn't preach the gospel. I'm telling you this gospel will put you straight but it'll give you joy. It'll give you peace. It'll give you power. You'll be honest before God and you'll have a testimony to this world. They're going to know who you are if you belong to Jesus. They knew these apostles. Yeah, I'm preparing my church. Yes. I am sanctifying my people. I will purge my church. Yeah, and I will prepare you for the coming day. For I need my people to be strong in the power of my might, said the Lord. Raise your hand and praise him. With all your heart, give yourself to be holy. Yes. For the day is here, said the Lord. Yes. Praise him right now. Listen to me. God chastises those that he loves. If I didn't do right, a boy coming up, I could expect a whipping. I call it a whooping. My dad get a hold of me, boy. He didn't have any mercy. But I made all right. He straightened me out. And I want to tell you, you don't get any help if you don't get any discipline. You've got to be corrected. The Father corrects those that He loves and He chastises those that He honors. And if you can't take chastisement, you are illegitimate. He will not own you. You cannot be His. But oh, you love it. You love it if you love God. You love His cause. He said we ought to obey God rather than men. I want to get the comfort part. Just a few thoughts and I'm going to close. I can't get the whole message. This is reverence. This is fear in God. That's the first thing you got to do. That's my attitude to God. Reverence for his house. Reverence for his commandments. Reverence for his word. Reverence for the saints. You can't talk just any way to somebody and have God. You got to love them. Did you hear me? Love them. Somebody said, I learned to love somebody. No, you didn't. You don't learn to love somebody. You learn to appreciate them. You love to honor them, but love is there whether you like it or not. You're going to love your enemies. Come on now. You're looking at me like a kind of stranger tonight. Our relationship doesn't only need to be right with God. It needs to be right with the church. Loving one another, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Then there's the comfort. We deal with God in the reverence. Then God deals with us when the comfort, he comforts a broken hearted. He said in Isaiah 57, 15, come to the instruments. I'm going to close in just about five minutes. Isaiah 57, 15, for thus saith the Lord, the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy. We can't get holy enough. Holiness is not something you graduate in. Holiness is something you are. You're not going to get any more holy when you get sanctified than you were when you got saved. You're either holy or you're not holy. You're not half holy. You're not 90% holy. If you're holy, you're holy. And when you get saved, you are holy. Your sins are gone. You're converted. Your name's written down in heaven. You go on to sanctification and that is a separation for you to live for God. To give you the ability to stand against the things that the encroachments that come upon your life. To give you the ability to live a clean, pure life for God. And then he gives you the baptism of the Holy Ghost to give you power to tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall any means hurt you. He said he's the holy one. I dwell in the high and lofty place. I'm his. You're his. One of these days we're going there. 
We're not going to be kicked around. We've been kicked around for years. The church has been despised, been persecuted, been called fanatics and names and everything else. But one day we're going to rule. It's going to turn around. He said, with him also that is of contrite and an humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. When we have God, we will be broken. That word contrite in Hebrew means crushed. In Psalm 34 and 18, the Lord is nigh to them that are a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Our spirit of this world, the things that oppose God and God's cause must be crushed. We must become totally submitted unto God. There's a sense of pardon when we have God's comfort. He said in Psalm 32, 1 and 2, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man in whom the Lord inputteth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. Blessed is a man that does that. Psalm 5 and 5, or Romans 5 and 5 said, And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. How does that love operate? It operates in the spirit. You can't serve God out of the spirit. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Get in the spirit. You'll have power with God. The comfort of the Lord includes a spirit of adoption in Romans 8 and 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. <laughs> this is the greatest thing going. The church is the greatest thing on the earth. It's better than a million dollars or a billion dollars or a trillion dollars. We're adopted into the family. The word adoption there says in the Greek, the placing as a son, being made a son of God and daughters of God. Then there is a manifestation of Christ in this comfort. In Ephesians 3, 17, 18, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comfort him with all saints, what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of God which passeth the knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. To know Christ. He said in John 14, 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. The indwelling of the Holy Ghost is important. He said in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy for the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are. Your body is a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. I didn't write it. God wrote it. But it's wonderful. Then last of all. This comfort includes a lively hope. Romans 15 and 13. Now the God of hope fill you with joy. And peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Everything happens when the fullness of time comes upon you and you become accustomed to God and His cause and His fullness is upon you and you're in complete victory. You will have joy. I can drive down the highway and nobody be in there but me and I have me a shouting time because I've got the Holy Ghost. And I want to tell you the greatest gift that God gave to the church outside of Jesus Christ is the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you something else. You're not going to give the Holy Ghost in you if you live like the devil. You live clean before God. You love your neighbors yourself. Love your enemies and do what that Bible said. You're a candidate for God. God will fill you and thrill you. Your cup will be like David. When he said, my cup runneth over, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for thou with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepares 
cast a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We've got the same house that Jacob had. Just a different form, that's all. We're in the house of God. I love the church of God. I love the teachings of the church of God. I don't like a lot of things I see. But I love what I know. And I know what's right. And I've got to be willing to fight. He said in 1 Timothy 6 and 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. One to thou art also called. And hast professed a good profession. Before many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. False. Paul said I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Which the Lord the righteous judge. Shall give me that day. And not to me only. But unto all them also. That love his appearing. If you love his appearance, stand straight up right now. Lift up your hands like lightning rods. Talking about fear and comfort. We need comfort. If God loves you, and he does, I love you. And the cause of Christ. I love the truth. I love the Bible. I want to live right. If you can't take mature correction and mature preaching, you need to get back to the altar. If it makes anybody mad for a preacher to preach the truth of God and To tell God's word what it is. If it makes them mad, it's a good sign. They're not even saved. You can't fight the word of God that saves you and be saved. You love it. Because it makes you what you are. I want a prayer line tonight. Let's get the altars, please. Pull them over here. Brothers, I thank you for your help. I want to be the pastor and the preacher of this church that changes people's lives. I'm not here to pit people on the back and I want to encourage people. I want to help help them. I want them to be blessed, but I want them to be changed. I want them to be changed. Praise God. Hold on to it. Don't let go of it. It's God. It's God. It's God. I need some more prayer words up here. Some of you men feel the Holy Ghost. Preachers, come up here and help me. Brother Tim's already up here. You need a help. You need a touch. God's ready to touch you tonight. He atatavashananai. Woo! Yes, it's real, brother. Bless your heart. Tell the church. It's no fantasy. It's real. Praise the Lord. It's real, people. Feel it in your bones. Hallelujah. Your heart. He came all the way from Fort Mill. He knows it. He's been raised in it. We've lost a lot of it. We got to get it back to the old past. Where's a good way? And walk therein. And shall find rest for your soul. It won't make you mad. It'll make you glad. <laughs> you don't have to beat people up. Just tell them what God said and let them make a choice. They're either going to take it or going to leave it. One or the other. The table spread. You can eat or you can run starve to death. That's up to you. I got a table spread here tonight. You can get all you need. All you got to do is come. I want you to get in the line if you need anything at all. And I know there's people here needing help tonight. You need for God to touch you. We're going to pray for you. Come on down here. Come on, get in line. Let God touch you right now. Maybe a monetary problem, you need money. Maybe something else, your children, or maybe sickness, and maybe you're having trouble with the devil worrying you, or whatever it is. Jesus is going to touch you tonight. You're going to leave here edified. You're going to leave here lifted up. You're going to leave here blessed. Come on now. Lay your hands on them in the name of Christ, the Son of God with power. The Son of God with power. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. Shut up. 
I say Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of all. He's the Lord of all creation. He's my Lord. He's your Lord. He's a Savior. He's a Savior. Bless you. The Lord is alive. I said He's alive. Touch Him, God. Woo! <laughs> Bless Him. Bless him, God. Bless his sister over here. Bless everybody going through this line. Everybody going through this line tonight. God, touch my brother. Touch him in the Holy Ghost. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Help him, God. You got something for him, God. You got something for him. You're going to move right now. Praise God. Come on, worship Him. My God, touch her. Shut out that cry. You've lived by faith. You're justified. You're justified by faith. Touch Him, God. Touch Him, Lord. Help Him. Touch Him. Touch Him, touch him God. Touch Him, God. Help Him. Heal Him. Move in his life. She la la bo, she la la bo, call la 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 la. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes. <laughs> there it is. She la la ba ba ka la la Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. la la ba ka la ba ba ba. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name, Father. Praise your name, Father. Praise your name, Father. Praise your name, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Meet her need. Help her. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Yes, God. Yes. Yes, God. Praise Him now. God's doing something for all of you. All of you coming through the line. God's doing something for God's doing something. For right Hallelujah. Out. Praise the Lord. I hold my life Thank you, Jesus. to Him. And from the rocks of sin, He has shown the light around me that I may clearly see.
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, God. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Help her, God. Thank you, Lord. Touch her. Hallelujah. Move on, her Father. Mm. There's a light Touch house her. on the hillside. Thank you, Lord. I've been praying for you. That old Hallelujah. Like sea. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It sends out a light. Yes, God. A light that Touch I him, Lord. might see. Touch him tonight. And the light that shines in darkness night oh, will yes. safely lead me on. Jesus, thank you, Jesus. If it was for up and praise you church praise him glorify the Lord tonight the Lord's in the house the Lord's in the house I've preached myself out tonight I'm tired Jesus amen amen <laughs> Amen. Touch her, Father. Help her, Jesus. Yes. Let her feel the touch of God. Move on her. Help her to put her hope in Christ. Lean on you in the name of Christ. Amen. Let me. Amen. Whew. Raise your hand and praise him. I want to. God bless her. Bless her strength in her, Lord. Strength in her body. You're her strength. Hallelujah. Messiah. Thank you, Jesus. Heal him! 
Yes. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Bless him, God. Bless him, God. That's right. <laughs> Bless him. Amen. I 
feel like traveling Yeah. 
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God's been good here tonight. Amen. Brother Jernigan's having surgery tomorrow, and Brother Lefford's having surgery Tuesday. Let's pray for them, Father. Be with both of them having surgery, God. Touch them in the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name I pray, Father. Touch them, God. Yes. I want us to pray for Brother Locklear, Brother Bobby Locklear's youngest daughter. He called me the other day and said that she's got cancer. What do you call it, cervical cancer? Told me they said they had it in the early stages, but still that's, cancer's a scary word. I, I want us to pray for that situation right now. Father, you know that need and I ask you to answer prayer and heal her and help her. In every way, God, move in her life. Move in her life. And touch her body. In Jesus' name, I believe it. Amen. Are you glad you came to church? Amen. Good to have Brother Penley with us. Appreciate you coming, brother. Hope you enjoyed yourself. <laughs> the Lord's here. And, uh, your mama is an old-fashioned Christian. She is. I remember her very well. I love you, church. I was tired when I preached tonight. My, I didn't, you know, but God helped me. God helps us, don't he? Aren't you glad you're saved? I want you to shake hands with somebody and say, I'm saved and I know I am. You can leave if you want to. I'm not going to dismiss. I love you.